welcome to U.S. Farm Report, a public relations program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in seeing American agriculture receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The American farmers and ranchers are building a brighter future for agriculture through the National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America and represents the leadership of agriculture. U.S. Farm Report presents National Farmers Organization Nationwide with Jack Grimmer from the state of California, Dwayne Carden from Georgia, Don Kimball from the state of Texas, Dick Mooney from Idaho, and Francis Angier from Vermont. Here now is Phil Allen, Farm News Commentator. Hello there. We're talking to you from St. Louis at the scene of the National Convention of the NFO. As you know, these are annual affairs, and this brings back to our minds the size of the National Farmers Organization when we met in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, just about a year ago. 29 states were in the NFO at that time. Uh, delegates are coming this year to St. Louis from 41 states. And uh, indeed, the National Farmers Organization is coast to coast, as our guests on the program today will uh, very strongly suggest to you. They literally come from states on the eastern seaboard and on the Pacific coast. Also, the NFO now, as we meet in St. Louis, is ready to expand into five more states. As uh, a rapid growing farm organization, we will soon get a hint as to why. I'm going to start at the end of the table with Mr. Grimmer and then uh, move along to Mr. Cardin and then to Texas, Mr. Kimball, and then Dick Mooney from Idaho and sitting next to him, uh, Francis Angier from the state of Vermont. So in that order, I'm going to give you an idea who these gentlemen are and we'll chat for a few minutes about the agriculture of their state. Uh, first, I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Jack Grimmer uh, from Arbuckle, California, which is in Caluso County. Uh, Jack Grimmer studied agricultural engineering at California Polytechnic. And uh, he also has some interests in agriculture. And we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, Jack, could you tell us something about the agriculture of your region? Well, <coughs> we have a wide variety of crops there. We raise uh, feed grain, uh, all vegetable crops, fruits, and pretty near all the major crops is grown in California. Yes, getting a description of California agriculture is <laughs> sort of like asking somebody <laughs> to describe the whole country's agriculture. Yeah. Uh, sugar beets in your area, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Tell us about your uh, position in the NFO. Well, I'm vice chairman of the Clusa County Charter and also chairman of the Feed Grain Committee. NFO has been organized just a few months in your area, hasn't it? Yes, uh, it first came to California at the end of January 1968, and then we were chartered about the middle of June. Sitting right next to um, Mr. Grimmer <coughs> is a gentleman from Georgia, Dwayne Cardin from Pavo, and that's in Brooks County, isn't it? That's exactly right, Phil. Supposing we start with you by telling about the agriculture of your state. Well, uh, economically speaking, Phil, uh, agriculture is the dominant sector of our uh, state's economy. And uh, as far as the variety of crops that are produced, uh, we are well diversified. We produce mostly cotton, tobacco, and peanuts as a cash crop. And then we produce quite a bit of corn, livestock, and watermelons, <coughs> truck crops of all different varieties. And uh, well, economically speaking, uh, farmers in Georgia are just as bad off as they are in any other part of the country. Now, the NFO is somewhat older in Georgia than it is in California. I can recall seeing delegates from your state uh, the past several years at our conventions. Yes, this is right. This makes my second year here. Uh, we had five states organized in Georgia uh, back about three years ago. But uh, it was kind of slow movement there because farmers uh, had never heard of a program such as NFO. And most of them didn't understand the uh, basic mechanics of, of our organization and our collective bargaining program. But since that time, we have moved in uh, a rapid uh, momentum and we have chartered about 50 more counties. Yeah, I think it might be interesting to Middle Western farmers to know that uh, you people are putting together marketing arrangements in corn livestock too, aren't you? That's right. We've got about 12 
We have 14 collection points in Georgia now, and we completed one about two weeks ago. And the first day that we blocked production together and moved it through there, we overrun it and had to stop the guys from bringing hogs in because <laughs> they just overrun the whole Wonderful. thing. Very good. Uh, you're also, let's see, you have a, a district position in the NFO too, don't you? That's right. I'm, I'm president of Brooks County and president of the second congressional district in Georgia and regional supervisor in about a 40 county area. Sitting next to Mr. Cardin is Don Kimball of Amarillo, Texas. Now, it may be that some of you are more familiar with the Texas story because we've broadcast this before on NFO programs. Uh, you're from Amarillo, right? That's right, yeah. I can recall I talked to you on a Watts line considerably about <coughs> an experience that you folks had there and blocking some production together. If you don't mind, we'll skip that part and uh, get back to it a bit later. Uh, can you tell us about the NFO coming to your part of Texas? Yes, uh, NFO came to Texas, and in, at least within our area of Texas, uh, Phil, in January of this year, and uh, had tremendous amount of response from the farmers. Uh, as has been known for some time, agriculture is in as bad a condition, if maybe worse, in Texas than anywhere else. And uh, the farmers are, are Phil, their backs are to the wall. They've got to do something, and something's got to be done immediately about prices, and NFO has the answer. Uh, and by that I mean the, uh, collective bargaining through blocking our production together. And uh, you know the saying has been for some time that you cannot organize farmers, and this is false. <laughs> because I have seen them lined up at meetings, organizational meetings, once they understand that uh, collective bargaining has worked effectively in every other segment of our economy, they are lined up down the line of tables signing membership agreements in the NFO, so much so that within a period of six months, we managed to block together enough production in the Panhandle area to be effective in the market to the point of 20 cents a hundred or better. Yes, we'll get to that story a minute later. That's on grain sorghum, isn't it? Yes, uh, yes. You, you also have uh, sugar beets in your part of Texas too, don't you? That's true. Uh, we have a large corporation in our area that uh, has built a, one of the largest plants in the nation uh, of sugar beets, and we it is one of our main cash crops, and of course, has. Uh, as a result of past uh, programs, has maintained a, a nice return. And uh, we have, uh, in that particular area, Phil, we grow uh, grain sorghum, wheat, sugar beets, and cotton. And of course, we have, are now becoming one of the biggest uh, feeding areas in the nation, which we- I might tell you people in the television audience that uh, Don Kimball is also a member of the Texas and New Mexico Sugar Beet Association Board. We'll pass along from you, Don, because we're coming back to you in a few minutes. Uh, sitting next to me uh, is Dick Mooney, who lives where in Idaho, Dick? Weezer, Idaho. This is in uh, Central Park, north of Boise, about 90 miles. You folks who follow football, I'm going to make a point here. If you remember the 1961 season, this is the same Dick Mooney who won the kickoff return record uh, among major colleges when you played for the University of Idaho, right? right. Uh, another detail on this, he was chosen by the Olympic Committee to represent the United States in the Pan American Games at Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, so we're glad to have you here as an athlete and as a farmer. Thank you, Phil. Does farming keep you pretty well in shape? Well, uh, as my grandfather used to say, the only walking you do here is from the barn to the trail to get on your horse. <laughs> is that the way it's done in Idaho you now? You bet. Very good. Uh, and you're also a member of uh, the American National Cattlemen's Association, this right? This is right. And cattle are pretty big in Idaho, I can imagine. Yes, Idaho is a fairly diversified state. If you start in the southern end of Idaho, you will come into the potato area, which Idaho is well known for. And as you go north, you come into the row crop areas with sugar beets, onions, potatoes, and uh, so on. And as you get on north, it's the cattle industry on up into the Palouse area, which is well known for its wheat. Then this area is where they have proven yields of over 90 bushels on uh, dry land grain. So uh, we're fairly well diversified. And that's a pretty high quality northern wheat too, isn't it? No, this is your uh, Gaines wheat, the soft white wheat, which is 80% exported. I see. Now, sitting next to Dick Mooney is a fellow from the opposite end of the country, you might say, but in another sense, uh, I noticed as they were chatting here before we went on the cameras, uh, Mr. Francis Angier, where are you from in Vermont, Francis? From the Champlain Valley, the western side of the state, Addison County, and also from the little township of Addison. So in a sense, the point I was making as you were chatting with Mr. Mooney is you're both 
uh, from mountainous sections and uh, mountain valley agriculture is quite familiar to both of you, isn't it? That's right. Even though one is from Vermont and the other is from Idaho. Uh, tell us a bit about Vermont agriculture. Well, Vermont is predominantly uh, dairy. I like to call it about 110% dairy because <laughs> of the support that they have from all of their people. They do have some orchards in uh, scattered sections of the state and, of course, a very small uh, maple sugar industry. And the kind of farming you do in Vermont. Uh, I, tell us about uh, having, let's see, you have the only uh, corn uh, combine in the state of Vermont, right? I believe that's right, according to the statistics. I uh, have been raising corn for some time for grain. Uh, all of the dairymen up there do produce quantities of corn for uh, silage. And uh, inasmuch as I had discontinued dairying, I wanted to keep my land from growing up into brush, so I put it into cash crops. And we also raise uh, a new variety of wheat, York Star, and we produce this for seed purposes. Very good. I'm going to get back now to Mr. Kimball for a few minutes, but I want to tell you some more about uh, Francis Angier. He's a member of the Extension Advisory Board for the University of Vermont. He also was a student at the University of Vermont. And you've been uh, flown your own plane, haven't you, in the, in the past years? I've flown for about 30 years. With the well, National welcome Guard. to the program as a pilot as well as a farm. Now back to Texas, or meanwhile back at the ranch, as we sometimes <laughs> say. Can you tell us about what your Texas panhandle people did in grain sorghum? Uh, Phil, of course, the first thing in, in collective bargaining is to block together your production. Uh, this was completely new to us, and as it usually is anywhere that the collective bargaining is uh, instilled into agriculture or any other area, I suppose, but um, the organization of counties that began to charter very rapidly, and as a result of this, membership grew rapidly, and uh, it was just prior to harvest, I suppose, that we began to sign up our production in, uh, in, in an effort to do block bargaining. And uh, it has been very, very effective, and surprisingly so. As I mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, this area of Texas, within 100 miles of Amarillo, Texas, uh, produces a third of the nation's grain sorghum, which, of course, is, is part of our feed grains program. Uh, as a result of this, with the blessing of uh, climate we have there, we have rapidly grown to one of the largest feeding areas in the nation. Uh, I talked to a fellow day before yesterday, in fact, that said that he knew of 18 new feed yards on the drawing boards to be completed that would exceed 20,000 head per lot. It's growing tremendously. So this, uh, as a result of this, uh, the demand for grain sorghum in feeding the cattle uh, put us in an advantageous position. and. Uh, Remarkably speaking, I, I, I'm amazed at the response we had from the buyers of our commodity. It's a known fact that cheap feed it makes cheap cattle, Phil. Yes, and, uh, absolutely. They were, they were aware of this, and uh, as a result, they, they continually uh, accept, they, they have given us acceptance. We have signed supply contracts with local feeders. Uh, the farmers are realizing what uh, strength they have in collective bargaining and we're being accepted on that scale. Well, the opportunity that these feeders presented you, I think, is interesting to all of agriculture, that you showed the people who moved to your area that they can't take advantage of cheap feed, which is something to think about. And while we're talking about a subject like that, uh, in general, wouldn't you say, Don, that collective bargaining, which pressures the price up in one commodity, mm -hmm. has a firming effect on all agriculture? Yes, it very definitely does. In fact, as a result of the price increase in grain sorghum, uh, we began to watch, and of course you, you've noticed the market on corn has gradually moved up. Of course, we're a small part of the, grain, of the feed grains program, but the effect of uh, bargaining in a block in any commodity will have the uh, effect of pressuring the market. Now, in this particular instance, uh, county by county, we have some large producing counties and, of course, some that aren't. Uh, as a result of blocking one major county, we found that the pressure on the market was tremendous and uh, sometimes exceeded five cents, maybe ten cents per hundred weight. Uh, we had, as I say, response. We also had good response from the grain trade. 
And uh, it occurs to me, Don, that some of these other fellows here from around the United States uh, who are members of the NFO might want to ask you Texans uh, a few things about how you put it together in your area. I think the television audience ought to note that we're talking to not only people from the four corners of the United States, there are also rather new members of the NFO, with the exception of Dwayne Cardin from Georgia. They're all members just within the past few months. Uh, do any of you fellows want to ask uh, Don Kimball anything about their experience in Texas? I'd, <clears throat> I'd like to ask him a question, Phil. Okay. Uh, Don, could you comment just a minute on the uh, situation in Texas as far as the cotton's concerned? Uh, we're a cotton producing state also, and uh, and on behalf of the fellows back home, if you could uh, mention about the situation with cotton out there, uh, the price range uh, for certain staples, and uh, so it com we could compare it with our situation in Georgia. Well, uh, Dwayne, as you're well aware, Texas is a large producer of cotton, and it has become a, a very a sad situation from the uh, price standpoint. Uh, I, the last time I checked the market, uh, normal grades were running from 15 to 20 cents per pound, which is something like 58 percent of what they should be. And uh, the farmers in the lower Panhandle area from there on South Texas are, are, uh, depend tremendously upon their cotton crop. Uh, as we've been organizing in that area, the advantage that we have, that we have had to, <coughs> in speaking with these men, of course, have been on our results of our grain cycle. But uh, the need for our cotton program is, is uh, Tremendous, and it's got to be done and, and quickly, because uh, we have, as you as you have in your area, I know, as I've spoken with you before, we have land values that have reached a point to where it's no longer profitable to operate and farm them. And, That's right. Uh, these people have got to. Uh, there's got to be something done. We're we're rapidly affecting the national economy. Well, I I would say then that what you and I need to do is close the gap from Georgia to Texas and, and get <laughs> right. Alabama and Mississippi right. in here, and let's get a, right. a commodity <laughs> department head on cotton. Thank you. Uh, Dick, did you have something that you wanted to make a comment here on? Yes, uh, Don, we also have these large feedlots in our area of, uh, in, in, in Idaho, and uh, in the last week we have signed some of these supply contracts with uh, this, this one area, one feedlot, and, uh, and, but basically what brought about our, our uh, contract was the potato growers. The potato growers went into a, an el eliminator program whereby they did not let any of their cull potatoes go into the processing <coughs> plants. And by doing this, this feedlot, which also is a potato processor, wasn't able to get uh, the waste potatoes to feed his cattle. And this also helped us in uh, getting grain contracts for us. Very good. <coughs> Jack, did you have a comment down there? Yeah, I wanted to say that in our area there, we blocked our miler together, uh, two counties there, and we felt we brought the, we brought the price up better than any market price has been there. It's been paid more. Just I to remind me, Jack, uh, what part of California is uh, it? This is the northern part. Northern. About uh, 50 miles north of Sacramento. And uh, this, is, this has brought the, the, the market up itself, but yet we're still above the market in our area. We're working with the rest <coughs> of the counties in our uh, state also, keeping coordinated with price. And I think this is helping all over the nation. Uh, these areas keeping together and, and not cutting each other's throat, so to speak. This, Phil, if I may say so, this is one of the things that has made NFO so outstanding. This is probably the first time that farmers have had an opportunity to belong to an organization that is so well unified, nation by nation. Uh, Dwayne here mentioned a minute ago tying Texas and Alabama together. This literally is true. You've no longer got state boundaries. You've no longer got commodity boundaries. You've no longer got these things that have been a detriment to a, to a fair price. The thing that Jack mentioned here, and as far as California, and I might go a little further if I may, Jack, to elaborate on that. California, of course, one of our major producers. Yet the feeding programs there have been tremendous over the years, and we have had California as a supply point for our grain sorghum in this area. But now, with coordinated effort through NFO, through each individual county as well as state mm -hmm. and national, uh, we can know daily, if necessary, exactly the circumstances and situations there, which means that there will not be tons and tons of excessive feed uh, poured into a market area in Jack's area, for example, that would depress the prices. Now, you know and I know that the major businessmen in the nation uh, who are success successful, the biggest corporations in the nation, uh, they have uh, inventory 
Yes. They don't have surpluses. And they, they think of their market as regional right. rather than by any sort of artificial boundary. They're you know? businessmen, mm -hmm. and they conduct their business accordingly, and of course we have the strong economy that we've been able to appreciate in the past, and this is exactly <coughs> what we're attempting to do. The experience of you people in the Texas panhandle reminds me of something I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Angier from way over in Vermont. Uh, now, organizing NFO just within, what, 10 or 11 months ago, wasn't it? Yes. Uh -huh. in the, in the and how long has NFO been in Vermont? Since February. About the same length of time, hasn't it? Right. Well, maybe both of you gentlemen can give me a, uh, an answer on this, and I'm asking it not just for us, but for some of the older areas in the NFO, uh, where it's been organized, well, as long ago as when we had to explain not only what NFO meant, but what collective bargaining is and the whole idea. Did it seem to you, Francis, that the people who joined NFO in Vermont came to it with a pretty good uh, set of convictions about bargaining together and selling together? No, I don't believe that they did. Uh, they're a very good dairymen up there. They're exceptional, yes. I think, across the country. And they're good businessmen. And they have done fairly well, as much as, price-wise, as much as the market would stand. However, as good as they are, we still lose an awful lot of these people. And uh, yes, I think and this is very, a nationwide pattern too, isn't it? Very few of us up there had any idea that we could ever get the farmers to work together. I don't believe it was a question of whether it would work if they could do it. It was a matter of getting the farmers to work together. They're very individualistic. Yes. I've often heard it said that the, this is the source of the farmer's greatest strength, but it's a kind of a, technical, a tactical problem. Uh, how about in Texas? Did your people come to it with some already convictions that they already held about bargaining together? Uh, yes, uh, as of course it has to be explained thoroughly, and uh, this is good. Uh, you find among agricultural people as well as others that uh, you know, they don't do anything, Phil, on the spur of the moment without understanding <laughs> what they're doing. And I personally wouldn't want to belong to, <coughs> right. pardon me, belong to any organization that did. But uh, as soon as the program is explained, they're aware of what's happened in other industries as far as collective bargaining is concerned. NFO will work. It is working. It, it will continue to work. And we're, we're very pleased with the strides. As a result of this, the farmers come to it. They understand the program. And as I say, I've seen them lined up, signing up for membership. Very good. This occurs to me that uh, Dick Mooney might have a view on a question like this. Now, from your association going back over quite a number of years in the Cattlemen's Association, does it seem to you that a, well, um, a group like that, oriented toward a, a commodity or a livestock, does the NFO experience bring anything, would you say, to a past experience with producing just one like that? Yes, uh, the, such as I mentioned before, the peer of the potato industry were, was helping the grain yes. industry, which in turn will help the cattle industry. Uh, by tying these all these commodities into one organization, we were able to do this. Or by the Cattlemen's Association, which uh, is now in a very, uh, a very good management pro program with their guidelines advising their members as to weights yes. and such as to uh, their selling. This has little bearing on the price and uh, it has little bearing on helping the grain industry or anything. Uh, actually, in many ways, it'll take advantage of the other industries. But in getting all these commodities into one organization, here they're helping into this industry. And by getting all these states also, I think this potato program, which was developed through the NFO, is a, a milestone, as you might say, uh, because here, they're, these processors now are trying to use one state against the other. Yes. And through the communication system between Oregon, Idaho, Colorado, Maine, they have been able to go through the national <coughs> office and each other. And, and uh, like last night, I heard a couple talking, and they said that in Oregon, when they told the, the processor he was, wasn't able to get these bee potatoes, he says, that's all right, I'll go to Idaho and get them. Well, all we had to do was send a, a phone call by, into Idaho, and, and they weren't able to move any bee potatoes out of Idaho either. So it is having a, a great bearing on our prices. You know, this is really quite a story that you fellows are telling, that as farmers themselves become nationwide in your outlook as to markets and all that, yeah. then these processors are beginning to have to deal with the nationwide organizations. Yes, and this is a must. And I might say this, too. I noticed you mentioned Texas quite a bit, but we had to get to work. These fellows in these older areas had been waiting on us too long, and they sort of told us we better work. We had to help them. 
Bill, may I ask uh, Mr. Sure. Kenny a question? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Sometimes we have a little petty anim animosity between our different organizations, forum organizations. And uh, I would like to ask him uh, if the Cattlemen Association members up in his area are pretty well taken to the NFO collective bargaining program. They don't mind being a member of two organizations, especially if it'll help them. No, this, is, this was uh, one of the ways that it grew so fast in our county areas. We have a uh, two county uh, cattlemen's association there, and now 80% of the cattle that's in this association is under membership of the NFO. In fact, you're an official of the cattlemen's association. This is correct, right. Right. Yes. in this county level. On, this might give me an opportunity to say something to the TV audience. We've made this point before, but let us emphasize it. The NFO really isn't in conflict with any other farm organization or any commodity group. Uh, you can, if you want to, stand paying that much dues, belong to all of them. The NFO would encourage <laughs> you to. It's like the two preachers who were talking about their building funds for their churches. No one could afford two, you know. I would like to mention an incident that happened in Georgia that uh, uh, could give a clear picture to everybody, really, who is uh, fighting who. Yes. Uh, this uh, implement dealer there uh, had a salesman come in one day and uh, to call on him about buying some discs, I think. And uh, while he was in there, there was two farmers came in, and one of them was a member of one farm organization, and the other one was a member of this <laughs> other farm organization. He might have to and be they, a referee. <laughs> yeah, he almost was in this uh, particular case. And they got to arguing uh, about the farm organizations, or in the name of the farm organization. And uh, in the uh, course there, they got a little bit uh, Rash there, and they went to a fist to cuff battle right there in the I showroom. <laughs> so after this was over, this salesman mentioned to the implement dealer, he said, uh, what's the fight going between these two organizations? And he said, well, he said, really, there's no fight between the organizations. He said, those two guys have been fighting over a line fence for 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> and that about sums it up, the animosity between the organizations. I think it does. The members. I think it really does. Uh, other organizations have a function to perform, don't they? This, this is right, and, and uh, when we were talking about the Cattlemen's Association in our own county, two-county area there, uh, with the association calls the NFO Moses. He's going to lead us out of the darkness. I see. <laughs> great. That's great. <laughs> uh, I think... Go ahead. Go ahead. I think we have a few seconds left. Now, I think most of the farmers uh, nationwide that have, have, have heard the NFO story have Generally, they have conceived the idea that they're going to have to rely upon their own efforts to adopt a collective bargaining program. And uh, it's evident that the NFO is the only organization that does have a definite uh, mechanism that can bring collective bargaining to agriculture. Yes, this might be a good point for me to remind the television audience that if you're interested in watching this program in joining the NFO, you can write to the Corning headquarters office. It's C-O-R-N-I-N-G, Iowa, Corning, Iowa. And one other point. We're interested in farmers generally because we feel, as these gentlemen have pointed out to you, that the National Farmers Organization is organized to perform a service. And we also need the ideas and the help of people from all over agriculture. And the NFO welcomes you as members. We need you, not just because you're a person who can join, but we need the ideas that you have. Practically everyone in the NFO belongs to something else first. That for today is something to think about. U.S. Farm Report has presented National Farmers Organization Nationwide with Jack Grimmer from California, Dwayne Carden, Georgia, Don Kimball from Texas, Dick Mooney, Idaho, and Francis Angier from Vermont. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at the same time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is a gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking for a new generation of agricultural producers. A brighter day for American agriculture. <laughs>